Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you are already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today, we are here to talk about some of the new releases coming out in May. All right, everybody. Today we are here to talk about some additional notable new releases that are coming out in May. If you are new to my new release videos that I wanted to go ahead and quickly remind everybody that the new releases that I'm going to talk about today, it's not meant to be a comprehensive list because prior to doing this new release video, I also do a book of the month prediction video. And all of the books that I mentioned in that video are also new releases that are coming out. So these are just the handful of new releases that are left over that I think you might want on your radar after having filmed that book of the month prediction video. So if you're interested in hearing a lot more about some fantastic new releases that are coming out in May, please feel free to check out that book of the month prediction video, which I will try to remember to leave linked down below. So now that that's all out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the new releases, starting of course with the very first Tuesday in May, which is going to be May 7. Now this first one that I want to talk to you about is one that I'm actually quite excited about because it's a new release by Serena Bowen. And while it does include a romance, it's not actually a romance. It is a thriller or more accurately, it's probably going to be like a romantic suspense. And I believe this is her first time doing anything like this. And so I'm really excited to see what she can do with the story. It is called The Five Year Lie and it's considered a domestic thriller. It says, she thought it was love, then he vanished. On an ordinary Monday morning, Ariel Cafferty's phone buzzes with a disturbing text message. Something's happened, I need to see you. Meet me under the candelabra tree ASAP. The words would be jarring from anyone, but the sender is the only man she ever loved. And it's been several years since she learned that he died. Seeing Drew's name pop up is heart stopping. Ariel's gut says it can't be real, but she goes to the tree anyway. She has to, nobody shows, but the text upends everything she thought she knew about the day he left her. The more questions she asks, the more sinister the answers get. Only two things are clear. Everything she was told five years ago is wrong and someone is still lying to her. The truth has to be out there somewhere. To safeguard herself and her son, she'll have to find it before it finds her. And with that, the answer to what became of Drew. For fans of Laura Dave and Julie Clark, but with a heart-stopping romance that only Serena Bowen can execute, The Five-Year Lie is a spine-tingling thriller that will have you guessing until the very end. So yes, this is definitely giving me the last thing he told me by Laura Dave vibes, although I'm hoping that this is a little bit better executed because I found the last thing he told me to be quite underwhelming, but I'm absolutely willing to give this book a try. I really enjoyed the True North series by Serena Bowen and I want to see what she can do in the thriller genre. So this is one that I am certainly excited to see coming out on May 7th. Next on May 7th, one that recently came to my attention is a book called When Cicadas Cry by Caroline Cleveland. It sounds like it's going to be like a southern kind of gothic thriller and you know I love those. I find them to be very atmospheric. This says, a high profile murder case. A white woman has been bludgeoned to death with an altar cross in a rural church off Cicada Road in Walterboro, South Carolina. Sam Jenkins, a black man, is found covered in blood, kneeling over the body. In a state already roiling with racial tension, this is not only a murder case, but a powder keg. A haunting cold case. Two young women are murdered on quiet Adisto Beach, an hour southeast of Walterboro, and the killer disappears without a trace. 34 years later, the mystery remains unsolved. Could there be a connection to Standers' case? And Standers is referring to Zach Stander, who is a lawyer in this story. And then it says, a killer who's watching. Stander takes on Jenkins' defense, but he's up against a formidable solicitor with power powerful allies. Worse, his client is hiding a bombshell secret. When Addie Stone reopens the cold case, he discovers more long buried secrets in this small town. Would someone kill again to keep them? I am absolutely down for this one. This one sounds phenomenal and I'm absolutely adding it to my TBR because this sounds like it's going to be right up my alley and there's definitely like kind of vibes of A Time to Kill by John Grisham in there as well. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, please be sure to keep this on your radar for the 7th. And then I only have one more to talk to you about for May 7th. It is Carly Fortune's newest release called This Summer Will Be Different. Y'all know that I read Every Summer After by Carly Fortune and I absolutely loved it. That book hit me harder than I was expecting it to. It was a very surprising five stars. I haven't read her other release called Meet Me at the Lake, but I'm very excited to do so. I'm just really intrigued by the synopses of her stories and based on my emotional reaction to Every Summer After, I'm hoping that I continue to have that with her books. It says, Lucy is the tourist vacationing at a beach house on Prince Edward Island. Felix is the local who shows her a very good time. The only problem, Lucy doesn't know he's her best friend's younger brother. Lucy and Felix's chemistry is unreal, but the list of reasons why why they need to stay away from each other is long and they vow to never repeat that electric night again. But it's easier said than done. Each year Lucy escapes to PEI for a big breath of coastal air, fresh oysters, and crisp Vinho Verde with her best friend Bridget. Every visit begins with a long walk on the beach beneath soaring red cliffs and a golden sun and every visit Lucy promises herself she won't wind up in Felix's bed again. If Lucy can't help being drawn to Felix, at least she's always kept her heart out of it. When Bridget suddenly flees Toronto a week before her wedding, Lucy drops everything to follow her to the island. Her mission is to help Bridget through her crisis and resist the one man she's never been 
able to. But Felix's sparkling eyes and flirty quips have been replaced with something new and Lucy's beginning to wonder just how safe her heart truly is. So I'm here for it. I'm intrigued. Like I said, I absolutely adored Every Summer After and I'm really hoping I adore Meet Me at the Lake as well. And so I know a lot of you are fans of Carly Fortune and I wanted to go ahead and mention this one here. All right, then moving on into May 14th, the first book that I want to talk to you about seems like it's going to be a magical realism romance. It's called The Honey Witch by Sydney J. Shields. It says 21 year old Marigold Claude has always preferred the company of the spirits of the meadow to any of the suitors who've tried to woo her. So when her grandmother whisks her away to the family cottage on the tiny Isle of Innisfree with an offer to train her as the next honey witch, she accepts immediately. But her newfound magic and independence come with a price. No one can fall in love with the honey witch. When Lottie Burke, a notoriously grumpy skeptic who doesn't believe in magic, shows up on her doorstep, Marigold can't resist the challenge to prove to her that magic is real. But soon Marigold begins to care for Lottie in ways she never expected. And when darker magic awakens and threatens to destroy her home, she must fight for much more than her new home at the risk of losing her magic and her heart. Okay, so not only is this a romance, but it is a sapphic romance and there's some magic woven in there. So it definitely sounds like it's going to be sweet, possibly a little bit heartwarming, but it sounds like there could be a little bit of darker elements in there. And I don't know, I just found this to be very atmospheric. I was really enjoying the vibes that I was getting from it. So I wanted to mention it here again. This is The Honey Witch by Sydney J. Shields coming out on May 14th. All right, another release that is coming out on May 14th that I wanted to quickly mention is the newest release from L. Kennedy. It is called The Dixon Rule and it is the second book in her Campus Diary series. L. Kennedy is a pretty well beloved romance author here in the online bookish community. I really don't want to read anything about the synopsis just in case it spoils anything from the first book, but I do believe that this contains a fake dating trope. So if you like L. Kennedy, if you like fake dating, this might be one that you want to check out. Be on the lookout for this one on May 14th. And then the final book that I wanted to mention for a May 14th release is the newest release by Christina Henry. It is called The House That Horror Built. It says Harry Adams has always loved horror movies, so it's not a total coincidence that she took the job cleaning house for movie director Javier Castillo. His forbidding Greystone Chicago mansion, Bright Horses, is filled from top to bottom with terrifying props and costumes, as well as glittering awards from his career making films that thrilled audiences, until family tragedy and scandal forced him to vanish from the industry. Javier values discretion, and Harry has always tried to clean the house immaculately, keeping her head down and keeping her job safe. She needs the money to support her son. But then she starts hearing noises from behind a locked door. Noises that sound remarkably like a human voice calling for help, even though Javier lives alone and never has visitors. Harry knows that not asking questions is a vital part of working for Javier, but she soon finds that the sinister house may be home to secrets she can't ignore. So I've actually never read a Christina Henry before. I know that she kind of alternates back and forth between thrillers and horrors, as well as kind of like darker fairy tale retellings. I know she had like that complete series of Alice in Wonderland retellings, and I know that some of y'all are a fan of hers, so I wanted to go ahead and mention this here. All right, and then moving on into May 21st, which actually appears like it's going to be the biggest release week in May. I definitely have the most to mention for this date, starting with the one that I'm most anticipating for May, and that's Ruth Ware's newest release, One Perfect Couple. I'm absolutely hyped to get another new release from Ruth Ware. And this one seems like it's going to be an isolated thriller set on a deserted island. So that is completely right up my alley. And of course there's going to be like, and then there were none aspects to this. It says Lila is in a bit of a rut. Her postdoctoral research has fizzled out. She's pretty sure they won't extend her contract and things with her boyfriend, Nico, an aspiring actor aren't going great. When the opportunity arises for Nico to join the cast of a new reality TV show called One Perfect Couple, she decides to try out with him. A whirlwind audition process later, Lila finds herself whisked off to a tropical paradise with Nico, boating through the Indian Ocean towards Ever After Island, where the two of them will compete against four other couples in order to win a cash prize. So we've got like a reality television show in here. I'm not really sure how I feel about that, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Not long after they arrive on the deserted island, things start to go wrong. After the first challenge leaves everyone rattled and angry, an overnight storm takes matters from bad to worse. Cut off from the mainland by miles of ocean, deprived of their phones, and unable to contact the crew that brought them there, the group must band together for survival. As tensions run high and fresh water runs low, Lila finds that this game show is all too real and the stakes are life or death. All right, so there are some things about this that I really like and some that I don't. I actually recently read a thriller by Will Dean that had that reality television show aspect to it, although a definitely a different take than what Ruth Ware is trying to do here. I don't really love the idea of a reality television aspect to it, but like I said, I absolutely love Ruth Ware. I'm probably going to read absolutely everything that she's ever written. I read her to zero up until this point and I love me a good isolationist thriller. So we will absolutely be reading this one and see how she does. Another really notable release that is coming out on May 21st is the newest release by Stuart Turton called The Last Murder at the End of the Road. I know that he is really highly acclaimed at this point. I haven't actually read anything by him, but I know The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle was a very, very popular book when it was first released. This says, solve the murder to save what's left of the world. Outside the island, there is nothing. The world was destroyed by a fog that swept the planet, killing anyone it touched. On the island, it is idyllic. 122 villagers and three scientists living in a peaceful harmony. The villagers are content to fish, farm, and feast, to obey their nightly curfew, to do what they're told, 
told by the scientists. Until, to the horror of the islanders, one of their beloved scientists is found brutally stabbed to death, and then they learn that the murder has triggered a lowering of the security system around the island, the only thing that is keeping the fog at bay. If the murder isn't solved within 107 hours, the fog will smother the island and everyone in it. But the security system has also wiped everyone's memories of exactly what happened the night before, which means that someone on the island is a murderer and they don't even know it, and the clock is ticking. So it definitely sounds like there's going to be some type of like dystopian type twist to this. There's going to be a locked room aspect as there's a very small cast of characters. They're all on this island being protected from the fog. So there's speculative aspects to this as well. This is very, very interesting. Like I said, I've never read anything by Stuart Turton before, but this one has certainly got me intrigued. And again, this one is coming out on the 21st. And another one that's coming out on the 21st that I know a lot of people are highly anticipating is the newest release from Stephen King called You Like It Darker. This is just a collection of 12 short stories. It says here, You Like It Darker? Fine, so do I, writes Stephen King in the afterword to this magnificent new collection of 12 stories that delve into the darker part of life, both metaphorical and literal. King has for half a century been a master of the form and these stories about fate, mortality, luck, and the folds in reality where anything can happen are as rich and riveting as his novels, both weighty in theme and a huge pleasure to digest. That's really all I'm going to say about it. Like I said, this is not a full-length novel. This is 12 short stories, but if you are a huge fan of Stephen King, if you plan to basically read anything he writes, this is one that you're going to want to keep your eye out for on the 21st. Also coming out on the 21st is the newest release by Kevin Kwong. He is the one that is best well known for Crazy Rich Asians, and this one is called Lies and Weddings. This blurb just says, a forbidden affair erupts volcanically amid a decadent tropical wedding in this outrageous comedy of manners from the iconic author of Crazy Rich Asians. And a globetrotting tale that takes us from the black sand beaches of Hawaii to the skies of Marrakesh, from the glitzy bachelor pads of Los Angeles to the inner sanctums of England's oldest family estates, Kevin Kwong unfurls a juicy, hilarious, sophisticated, and thrillingly plotted story of love, money, murder, sex, and the lies we tell about them all. So I'm just getting some good fun vibes here. It sounds like it's not going to be something that takes itself too seriously. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of humorous aspects to it. I've never actually read a Kevin Kwong, so I don't know if his stories ever die into the deeper territories, the darker territories, so you'll have to let me know. But for those who are fans of Kevin Kwan, be on the lookout for this one on the 21st. Also on the 21st, we have the main character by Jacqueline Goldis. She wrote The Chateau, which I haven't read, but I know was getting a lot of buzz. It says, reclusive mysterious author Ginevra X is famous for her unusual approach to crafting her big best-selling thrillers. She hires real people and conducts intensive interviews, then fictionalizes them. Her latest main character, Rory, is thrilled when Ginevra presents her with an extravagant bonus, a lavish trip along Italy's Mediterranean coast on the famed, newly renovated Orient Express. But when Rory boards the train, she's stunned to discover that her brother, her best friend, and even her ex-fiance are passengers, all invited by Ginevra, all hiding secrets. With each stop, it becomes increasingly clear that Ginevra has masterminded the ultimate real-life twisty plot with Rory as her main character. And as Ginevra's dissensions mount and the lies and machinations of Rory's travel companions pile up, Rory begins to fear that her trip will culminate like one of Ginevra's books with a murder or two. In the opulent compartments of the iconic train, Rory must untangle the shocking reasons why Ginevra wanted them all on board and to what deadly end. That's another one that sounds like it's going to be a good fun time. You have people all trapped on a train, something sinister is going on, Rory doesn't really understand why all of these people from her life are there on the train and she has become the main character in this writer's newest story, if you will. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'm a little bit intrigued, I've got to be honest, but like I said, I've never read The Chateau, so this one I'm not entirely sure if I should be hyped to read or not, you'll have to let me know, but I did want to go ahead and mention it here. And this last one that I want to mention for the 21st is actually one that I considered including in the book of the month prediction video. I know that there were a lot of people that thought that this could be a contender and it still absolutely could be in like the literary contemporary field. It is called I Hope This Finds You Well by Natalie Sue and I just really dug the synopsis of this. It says, as far as Jolene is concerned, her interactions with her colleagues should start and end with her official duties as an admin for Super Shops Inc. Unfortunately, her irritating incompetent co-workers don't seem to understand the importance of boundaries. For Secret to Survival, she vents her grievances in petty email postscripts, then changes the text color to white so no one can see that. That is, until one of her secret messages is exposed. Her punishment, sensitivity training, led by the suspiciously friendly HR guy Cliff, and rigorous email restrictions. When an IT mix-up grants her access to her entire department's private emails and DMs, Jolene knows she should report it, but who could resist reading what their co-workers are really saying? And when she discovers layoffs are coming, she realizes this might just be the key to saving her job. Plan is simple. Gain her boss's favor, convince HR she's super shops material, and beat out the competition. But as Jolene is drawn further into her co-workers' private worlds and realizes they are each keeping secrets, her carefully constructed walls begin to crumble, especially around Cliff, who she definitely cannot have feelings for. Eventually, she will need to decide if she's ready to leave the comfort of her cubicle, even if that means coming clean to her colleagues. So this absolutely sounds like it's probably going to be like a comedy of errors. Maybe that sounds like there's going to be some quirky characters. There's going to be some secrets that are passed between emails and our main character is going to know it all. I just absolutely loved the tidbit of her being very petty, being very passive aggressive, 
obsessive by including things in our emails that are in white text that nobody can see. I just thought that was absolutely hilarious because I'm not going to lie, that just really appeals to me sometimes when I get those emails that really, really aggravate me. So I just thought that this sounded like a lot of fun and I wanted to mention it here in case you hadn't heard of it. All right, everybody, and now we are moving on into May 28th and I actually only have one book that I wanna talk about. It is the newest release from Alex Finley called If Something Happens to Me. It says, for the past five years, Ryan Richardson has relived that terrible night, the car door ripping open, the crushing blow to the head, the hands yanking him from the vehicle, his girlfriend Allie's piercing scream as she is taken. With no trace of Allie or the car, a cloud of suspicion hangs over Ryan, but with no proof and a good lawyer, he's never charged. Though that doesn't matter to the podcasters and internet trolls. Now Ryan has changed his last name and entered law school. He's put his past behind him. Until, on a summer trip abroad to Italy with his law school classmates, Ryan gets a call from his father. Allie's car has finally been found, submerged in a lake in his hometown. Inside are two dead men and a cryptic note with five words written on the envelope in Allie's handwriting, if something happens to me. Then halfway around the world, the unthinkable happens. Ryan sees the man who has haunted his dreams since that night. As Ryan races from the rolling hills of Tuscany to a rural village in the UK to the glittering streets of Paris in search of the truth, he has no idea that his salvation may lie with a young sheriff's deputy in Kansas working her first case and a mobster in Philadelphia who's experienced tragedy of his own. In classic Alex Finley form, If Something Happens to Me is told by several distinct compelling characters whose paths intersect, detonating into a story of twist after pulse pounding twist. I actually find that very, very intriguing, but I'm a little bit hesitant because I read Every Last Fear by Alex Finley, which just came out last year. I think that was his newest release and I didn't love it. I really didn't. I think I gave it a three stars and I think that was probably being pretty generous, but this sounds like it's going to be a wild and twisty time. They're going to be going all over the world and there's going to be a lot of different connections that are being made. This could definitely be one that I consider reading in the future. And I know that Alex Finley is growing in popularity as a thriller author. So I definitely wanted to make sure that this one was on your radar. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are just some of the additional new releases that I wanted to mention for May. If you have any other new releases that you want to mention, please feel free to do so down below to let everybody know some additional new releases that are coming out. I try to give as many new releases between this video and the book of the month prediction video as possible. So you have a really solid idea of what is coming out and so that you can add these books to your TBR. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me some type of tropical plant, tropical flower emoji, like a hibiscus or a palm tree in honor of some of the tropical locations that are coming out in the books next month. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with any books that I might talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.